service tonight. How many is ready to go home? <laughs> I shouldn't have asked that question. Then. First Timothy chapter 3. I don't know if it's a shout message or not, but nevertheless, I'm going to do what I feel like the Lord's laid upon my heart. I kind of feel weird by preaching this because I would feel like everybody in here would know to do this, but I never try to over knowledge God. He knows all things, and all I do is just go and listen to Him and what He tells me to speak. I try to do my best to speak it, not trying to judge and say, well, Lord, they already know that because His Word is for a reason. Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Verse number one. I'm just going to read pretty much the whole chapter. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire the good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, out to preach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjected with all gravity, the, the gravity or gravity, however you want to pronounce that word, but that word is not the gravity of floating around in the in the in the galaxy. That word means seriousness or, or grave. It comes from the word grave. Um, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children subject with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice. That word means someone new to the faith, someone who is uh, don't have no root, less being lifted up with pride. He fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. You want to know how good your preacher is? Go ask somebody that don't that, that don't have a whole lot, not the big shots. Ask the one who. I'll tell you the truth and just lay it out there to you. Amen. Amen. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double toned, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith and a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderous. That word means gospers. Sober, faithful, and in all things, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon, well purchased to themselves a good degree, and a great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. Now, I want you to focus upon this next scripture. This is where the Lord's dealing with my heart to preach on tonight. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest behave thyself in the house of God. Which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Father, I thank you tonight for your word. We don't hear these books preached very much. These are the backward books that most people run from, Lord. But your, your, your spirit is just dealing with my heart tonight to teach on the behavior in the house of God, Lord. And I feel like tonight that this whole chapter was dedicated to the leaders of the house of the Lord, God, because I believe things rise and fall upon leadership. And, Lord, I pray tonight that you would just help me to bring all things to my remembrance, the things that I've read in your word, Lord, that teaches us how we ought to behave in ourselves in the house of God. For these books that were written to Timothy, not only not only the first book, but the second book was teaching us how to present ourselves, how we should act, how we should dress, how we carry on our conduct and our things in the house of God. For we are to reverence your house. We are to enter in here with fear and trembling, Lord, and work out our own salvation, Lord, before you. I pray tonight the abundance of my heart, my mouth to speak, and my heart may be filled with love. And I'll give you all praise for in Jesus' name we pray. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord some praise for you. I want you to ask yourself a question. Have you been behaving yourself? <laughs> Come on, ask. Have you been behaving yourself? Praise God. As I, as I began to seek the Lord, this is what he laid upon my heart. Go and tell my people to behave themselves in the house of God. And 
And I thought to myself, Lord, I thought we did behave ourselves in that. And I'm not saying we don't behave ourselves in the house of God. But how many knows the house of God is to be reverenced? Amen. It's a place of, of, of God's presence dwelling, although he does not dwell in this temple. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. He dwells with inside of us. But the way we treat the house of God lots of times has to do with the way we treat ourselves. For the Bible said he that's faithful over a few things. If we don't know how to take care of the building of the house of God, then we don't know how to take care of our own temple. Amen. I mean, how many knows we should take care of our own temples? Amen. The Bible said we should not defile our temple. For if we defile our temple, he will destroy us. And I just feel like doing a little old school preaching tonight. The Bible addresses the pastor or the bishop or the leader of the church first. And it's always good for the preacher to preach to the preacher, isn't it? Amen. Nobody have to worry about their toes being stomped on but myself. And I just, I can't understand myself how, how ministers, you know, the Bible teaches us that a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire good work. And the Bible teaches us that us ministers are to be blameless. And I don't know about y'all, but that's pretty strict. That's pretty strict doctrine to go by. Should we we should be blameless, but we're always looking for an excuse out of living blameless. But I believe if the Lord said that we should live blameless, I believe I believe we need to do what we can to strive to to live blameless. The Bible teaches us that in the book of Jude that He's able to present us faultless before our God. But we go around too many times looking to fall. We we think of ourselves that we can't live up to God's expectation. We can't be holy. We can't live righteous. We can't be perfect. We can't do this. We can't do that. But that's all contrary for what the Word of God says to do. God says that we could be holy. The Bible said, be ye holy for I am holy. And I may not get much praise and can claps and applaud right now, but I'm just going to rear back and preach what the book said. How many, how many came to hear what the Word had to say? Amen. I'm tired of hearing what, what this one has to say and what that one has to say. Too many times we preach what mama said and what daddy said. And it's okay to preach what mama said and what daddy said as long as it lines up with the word of God. But there's many a times that we have to be different from the world. Amen. We can't blend in with the world. The Bible said if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Sometimes God will call you to live life unfair. Praise God. You won't be friends with everybody. When you begin to live for God and sell out and tell God I want to follow you with all my heart, some of your own family won't have nothing to do with you no more. Some of your own people that you've known all your life and has been friends with you, when you begin to walk with God, they'll forget your telephone number. They won't never call you no more. And I'm here to tell you, as long as you got God on your side, it don't matter who don't call you. It don't matter who shakes your hand. It don't matter who walks by you. If the Lord's pleased with you, that's all that matters to hear Jesus Christ say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter in. Praise God. There's too many people in the church is trying to impress everybody else. They're trying to live for this one's expectations or this one's standards. I believe we ought to search the scriptures for our own self and get into the word of God and work out our own salvation. Quit letting everybody else work it out for us. How many believe that? Praise God. When I first got in church, this one tried to teach me you got to live like that. That one tried to teach me to live like this. And it wouldn't be, wouldn't be very long that you'd see them fall by the wayside. I'm telling you, you cannot be led by man, for man will fail you. I don't care how good he is, how good of a preacher he is. Sometimes we look at people as if they're, they're flawless. They can never fail. But I'm telling you, if you want to present your body as something, present it a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, let God work what he wants to work out in you and quit letting everybody else lead you. The Bible said, as many be led by the Spirit are the sons of God, not by your brother that's sitting beside you or your sister beside you. If I look like they look or act like they act or talk like they talk. I'm going to make it known. You pattern yourself after Jesus Christ for we're following Him. Amen. We're not being led by man. Praise God. The Bible said a man should be faultless. Yet and still, lots of times we don't try to even attempt to live faultless. We go around with this pitiful attitude. Well, you know, we just all fall. And that just justifies our, our bad behavior. That does not justify our bad behavior. That may justify our bad behavior before man's eyes, but you don't need to worry about man. You're not going to be judged by man. You're going to be judged by God. And if he said that we should live faultless, and I believe we ought to try our best to live faultless. Amen. The Bible said that he ought to, he ought to be the husband of one wife. Praise God. 
These preachers nowadays just go off and leave their wife and get them another and keep on trucking. Never quit preaching. Churches fill up too. I mean, people are going to flock to these people. Listen, I'm thinking to myself, what Bible do they read? Right Amen. There's been a lot of times my wife got on my nerves. There's been a lot of times I got on her nerves. But we learned to work it out somehow or another. Praise God. The Bible said, for what God has put together, let no man put us on. Oh, this preaching ain't popular. This preaching ain't cool, but it's preaching. It's preaching the word of God. Amen. Can't just leave your wife and go marry you another because the biscuits ain't good. Better go to Hardy's and keep your marriage. <laughs> when you tell folks this kind of stuff, they get angry and you say, well, the Lord forgives everything. I ain't saying he won't forgive you. But how do you keep preaching when the Bible said that we should be faultless in the husband of one wife? Amen. It's quiet, ain't it? If we know we we know bukus of them out there, TV ministers and all this, been caught with with with, with a little girl with a shorty shorts on it, and the next thing you know, we confess it to the world and we keep preaching. Yeah. How do you do that? How do you do that? I tell you how we do that. We don't care what the word of God has to say no more. We we've learned to go by our bylaws and and what our district says and what this one says. Forget what the word. And let me tell you something. If the district don't follow the Bible, you better start following the Bible. Don't worry about the district. Yeah. Amen. I heard them in our school when we went to school to get credentials. People was up there talking about you know that 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 all. Um, and I'm not here to pull things about the past. If you've been Married and divorced and remarried. I'm not. I'm not here to do that. But what I'm saying is, if the Bible says the husband one wife, that's what he meant. That's what he meant. You go buy another translation, another book to try to figure out what the Greek and the Hebrew is. But the Bible said the husband of one wife. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Oh, it's quiet, Lord. <laughs> you go to preaching about marriage and stuff like that. Nobody talk to you. But how do you skip those pages? If we're a full gospel church, we need to read the whole book. Yeah. Let's don't skip no pages. Let's read it. If we're scared to read it, then we haven't got a revelation of how powerful the blood is. Amen? Praise God. And they would tell you up in school, they'd say, well, I'm thinking about it. We just need to change the bylaws. Because somebody just can't help this and just somebody can't help that. And all I thought to myself, no, you're not trying to change the bylaws. You're trying to change the word. To, you, you know, I, it gets on my nerves when people try to change the word to suit their sin. Amen. Come on, Amen. If the word says it, quit trying to change the word. Change you. Right. Change you. Then the church will be better off. I feel tension up in this house. <laughs> you think, you know, you, you know we, we say that we're obeying the Lord, but when we begin to actually read the Bible, it's harder than what it looks like to obey the word yes. and obey the Lord. But Paul was telling young man Timothy, because Timothy was a son of the faith to the apostle Paul, and Paul was beginning to tell him how to get his house in order. Because if our houses are not in order and our churches are not in order, then it's going to be hard to get anyone saved because if we're no different than the world, then what do they have to come to? Amen? Amen. Amen. I like what the Apostle Paul said, and we got to take this with uh, the old seesaw illustration that I give about the fat man and the little man. You, you got to have a just balance. How many have ever seen the seesaws on the playground? Yeah. If a fat man gets on one end, little man gets on the other, there ain't going to be much seesaw going on, okay? So we got to get an equal balance of what the Lord's called us to do. And in his word, he teaches us that. That we are to live holy. But Paul says this. Paul says he has become all things to all men whereby some might be saved. That scripture is in your Bible. We have, he, Paul said I have become all things to all men whereby some might be saved. And let me tell you what he's talking about. He wasn't talking about becoming sin and hanging out with him and, and juking with him and this, that, and other. But what he was saying was that he was not no longer going to strain out a nap and swallow a camel and let somebody go to hell on his watch. Because when Jesus Christ came, before Jesus Christ came, the people who were not circumcised were Gentiles and they were considered unclean. They were not to receive the Spirit of God. 
this, that, and other. But when Jesus Christ came, he broke down the veil, and the veil of the temple was rent in twain. That whosoever came to God, he wouldn't cast them out. Amen? But even though Christ had came and the Holy Ghost had fell upon some of the Gentiles in the book of Acts, just like it fell on the, the disciples, the 120 disciples, that proved to them that the Gentiles could also be saved and could also receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so after the Gentiles received the Holy Ghost, then the argument kept on going about the circumcision and the uncircumcision. Some people still followed by it. Some people didn't go about it. Matter of fact, Paul withstood Peter to his face because he was to be blamed because when he was around the Jews, he acted like the Jews but didn't want to have nothing to do with the Gentiles. But when the Jews went away, he hung out with the Gentiles like he was their best friend. Let me tell you something. You don't need, don't need to be wishy-washy. Whoever you are in church, you need to be out there on the streets. Praise God. I, I think it's. I, I think I find preaching so easy to preach because I am who I am behind this pulpit. I mean, I'm just, I just ain't got no sense, and the Lord just gives me words to say, and, and so I don't get up here and trying to act like somebody I'm not. You know, it's hard to be someone you're not. That is one of the hardest lives to live is go around trying to be someone you're not. Because one of these days you're gonna mess up, and the real you's gonna come out. Amen. So God comes in our heart, and, 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 and so that's where Paul talks about the uncircumcision the circumcision, because some were still saying salvation was about the circumcision, and Paul said it don't have nothing to do with the circumcision of your foreskin. It's all about the circumcision of your heart. But Paul did not let this circumcision argument stop him from preaching the word of God. Because some people felt like that, that they wasn't uncircumcised and they weren't worthy to go around. They were considered dogs. Gentiles were considered dogs. But Paul said, I've become all things. Dog. Paul said, I ain't scared to go around because I know without Jesus Christ, they're going to hell. And the only way they're going to hear about Jesus Christ if the ones that have Jesus Christ has enough boldness to go share the love of the gospel. Praise God. Praise God. There's people out there tonight that needs to hear the gospel. Yeah, amen. Just because they don't look churchy and act churchy, some people are scared to go around. And they don't act like me. And they don't talk like me. And they never are until we go out and share the gospel. Because you ain't always act the way you act. Amen? The only reason we are who we are is by the grace of God. Isn't that what Paul said? Amen. Paul said, you take away the grace, you take away the blood, and I'm still an old same wretched sinner. Begging for, for eternal life. Yeah. So we, we, we don't need to be so, we need to have a just balance. We are to behave ourselves in the house of God. But when our behavior becomes out into the world so high and mighty that people, people look at us as if we're better than them. That, that's the wrong attitude to have to the world. We are to be light. We are to be salt. We are to be different. The Bible said we are peculiar people. We're a holy nation. We're a royal priesthood. We're, we're zealous of God's praises to come out from among the world, to be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. He'll receive us under himself. But in all of this, we need to remember that the only way that we can be separate is by the blood of Jesus Christ. And the people in the world need to see that and they need to hear that. Praise God. So how do we behave ourselves in the house of God? First of all, we line up with the word of God. Leaders, I'm talking to leaders to start with. He talked to leaders because to me, uh, the way leaders act is going to have a lot to do with the way the church acts. Right. Yeah. I, I, I've harped for our leadership since I've been here. Some listen, some don't care. But leadership should be at church if they could, if it possibly can be. Because if we're not at church, then guess that what that paints to the whole church? Well, you can miss church too. It's okay. Just lay around. Be lazy. Amen? And so I'm very against. I'm anti-against leadership that don't like to come to church. I push in a business meeting for you not to get voted in as a leader of the church. You may not like me. I'm not here for you to like me. Okay? Let's get that straight. Right off the bat, I'm not here to gain friends. I'm here to pastor a church. Amen? And a pastor's not always going to be your best friend. He's going to get under your skin from time to time. And so the Bible says, forsake not the sin of ourselves together. And I've had people to rare with this and bite with this and fight with this and this and that. And I know there's sometimes you can't come. But when you can't, you know what? I, I heard a preacher say one time, and it convicted me. I was sick, man. I was, 
laid up around the house, and I and when I'm sick, I don't I'm, I'm confess that I'm a miserable sick. I just lay there and I don't. I'm, and so I was watching TV and I was turning on there listening to a preacher. And he was saying, you know what? He says, you want to be a better preacher, but you don't want to read your Bible. You want to listen to me. <laughs> oh, he got all over my toes. He says, you say that you don't, you, you're too tired. That's what he was talking about. He said, sometimes at nighttime you say you're too tired to read the Bible, but you ain't too tired to sit there and watch that TV all night. Great, uh, great. You, you, you say you're tired when you get out. Isn't it amazing how when you open your Bible, you go to yawning? Yeah. Isn't it amazing that you've been awake all even long until I go to preach and you'll fall asleep right before me? <laughs> this isn't a coincidence. This is the devil's work because he knows there's something in the Word of God that you need. And if he can bore you and if he can put you to sleep, you can sit back there with that tall mouth. Yeah, I'm just tired. You don't understand, preacher. Go ahead. You're letting the devil rob you of your blessing. You ought to stay awake and make some racket and move and dance and shout. And whatever you need to do to get what you have to get from the Lord. But no, we won't fight sleepless. We won't fight tiredness. We won't fight laziness. That's most of all what it is is laziness. Amen. We just become we become accustomed to being lazy and slothful, and the next thing you know, it follows us up in church. Praise God! On, and so, leaders are to spend some time in God's Word to make time for God's Word. The Bible said to study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. But no wonder He addresses leaders to teach us how to behave, because if we don't know how to come to church, we're teaching the whole church not to come to church. There's no need in sitting around and fussing about the pews being empty when we're at home our own self. Hey. What else should leaders do? The Bible said he would have all men to pray. To pray, to prayer be made by all men, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. It's amazing how people are supposed to be leaders in the church and never show up to a prayer meeting. Come on. Come on. They can sit there and watch TV all evening long, but you talk about come out 30 minutes early for church, they couldn't make it if their life depended on it. I'm telling you, you want to know why the church is so weak? Because our prayer life is zero. When we get prayer life back involved in the church, we'll see the movement of God. We're trying to move God with our actions and with our preaching. You don't move God with actions and with preaching. You move God with prayer because prayer is the, is the fuel that gets God moving. If my people, and I'm going out and over that scripture out too many times, but nevertheless, he tells us, he tells us leaders of how we're to present ourselves. Amen. Yeah. He says the husband of one wife, not given to wine. I don't know about y'all, but I don't drink no more. Amen. Now it's a big argument about wine. <laughs> and I know what this denomination believes, what that denomination believes, but I feel like it wasn't Kool-Aid. I'm just going to be honest with you. I, that's my opinion, because if it was, he wouldn't have said drink a little bit. No Kool-Aid, you can drink a whole gallon, it ain't going to hurt you. But anyhow, that's a deep subject, and I ain't getting into it tonight, because I don't want to sit here and argue with you all night long. But I don't want the wine. I don't want none of it. That's just me. I don't, I don't want a sip of it, because if I drink a sip of it, I know what it's going to lead to. I'm going to get another sip of it. And I, I've always, I always liked to drink back in the days, and so lead me not into temptation. But there's a lot of people who feel like that they can just go out and, and you know, and, and, and drink a little casual drink and all of this. And I had a man ask me one day, and I'm telling you scripturally, you can search the Greek, the Hebrew, and do all this and all this and other, whatever you want to do. But scripturally, you know, <laughs> lots of times you get, you get your mouth closed. You just really can't open it. Scripturally, sound doctrine. But uh, I had a man ask me one day, he, he came up to me, and, and I knew he drank, and he went to church, and, and a pretty good fellow, you know, but, you know, he asked me, he said, Brother Brandon, what do you feel like about a man taking a drink? I just sit there, and I listen to him. Now, what you think about it? <laughs> there you go, when you, when you fire that question back, what you think about it? Well, I don't think it is, and I don't think it hurts, and I don't know this, if a man's sick, and this, all this, that, and other. And uh, I told him whenever I, I was sitting there listening to my spirit, Lord, what, what do you want me to tell this, this gentleman? And when he got through talking all of his talk and, and this, that, and that, I told him, I said, I'll tell you what the scripture does say. The scripture says that drunkards shall not inherit the kingdom of God. 
I said, if you can take you a drink, that's between you and Lord. But if you get drunk, you're going to hell if you don't repent of it. That's what the Word teaches. Come on, Amen. 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 There's a lot of people, you know, and I ain't sitting here trying to argue with people, but anyhow, they, they, they think that a little, you know, a little drink of wine or this, that, and other send your soul to hell, but they're still taking down cough medicine to heal up with codeine. <laughs> Same thing. It's getting you high. That's why you go to bed sleep and you can't hold your eyes open. But if the doctor prescribed, it's okay. Right? And so Timothy is told here not to drink any, uh, the pastors or, or the bishops are not to drink any wine. The deacons are to drink a little wine. Even scholars say that the reason that he was told to drink a little wine was because of algae in the water and their stomach infirmities. He said often for that stomach infirmities. And to clear up infection. So alcohol was made for medicine. And things as the Bible even says in the book of Proverbs. It's strong drink belonging to those that perish. Some people don't believe in stuff like that. But let me tell you something. You get on your deathbed and you go to hurting bad enough. You want some type of relief. And, and, and a lot of this stuff that they call law. Uh, sedating their people on their deathbed and the hospice comes around and starts poking stuff to them. That's all that is. I'm telling you, it may be another name for it, but they're getting drunk and they're getting high and they're getting sedated where they don't even know they're there. So, anyhow, but it is not made for God's people to be drunk and to be high. We're to be sober and in our right mind. Can I get an amen? Amen. I ain't heard an amen out of in a while, but I'm preaching the Bible tonight, and you can argue me if you want to, but I got the Bible, okay? Amen. I ain't got the Greek and the Hebrew, but I got the Bible. Amen. The Bible tells us, Lord, that we should we should have a, a straight mind, a sober mind. We should be the leadership of the church. It tells us how to how to talk. The Bible tells us even how to how to have our speech, not lying. Man, people will lie to you in a minute nowadays. And they'll even tell you a joke. Oh, that is just a joke. When I believe that's why the Word of God plainly tells us all liars, not some of them, not those that are serious liars, but all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. But there are ministers who get behind this pulpit and just for a joke and just for a laugh and just to make fun will sit there and tell a lie behind the pulpit and say, ho, 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 I'm just joking. Come on. You're lying. That's what you're doing. And if you don't tell the truth, and you may say, well, you shouldn't be so critical of all this. But the Bible teaches us that if we, if we talk like that, then, you know, that people have no confidence in our words. That's right. That's right. It amazes me how people will go around picking. Even in this church, we got people go around picking with people. Picking out, picking out. Boy, the next thing you know, somebody pick back out and they're ready to fight. <laughs> oh, no, you've been picking and picking. If you can give it, you ought to be able to take it. And that's why we shouldn't do that kind of stuff anyway, because you never know when somebody's in a bad mood and they don't feel like being played with. Right. And so when we begin to play with them, begin to pick at them, this, that, and other, then the next thing you know, fights begin to happen. I've seen grown men tussle and wrestle in the house of God. Play like it's a playground. This ain't a playground. This is a sanctuary. Amen. Amen. The Bible teaches us to lift up holy hands. You know, as leaders of the church, we should be praise leaders. Praise God. We should learn. We should teach the church how to worship and how to praise. Amen. Amen. And I tell you, that's one thing that's needed in churches around. A lot of these Pentecostal churches that they call holiness churches, you can hear a pin drop in them. Man, it, should be, it used to be so loud. People could hear them praying from down the road. You can't hear them pray no more. What's wrong? What, what's, what, what, what happened? Whatever happened? We need to quit talking about it and begin to make some noise, not just some racket, but we need to make some, some praise start to gift us within us, begin to worship. Amen. And sometimes it seems like a funeral home when you walk in the house of God. The Bible said, why seek ye the living among the dead? It's a shame when the people let the honky-tonks going around cutting a two-step and a line dance and having fun and the loudest people you ever want to hear. And you walk in the house of God, we're quiet. That's backwards. They should be the ones that's quiet. We're the ones that's got the victory. We ought to be doing the shout. I ain't talking about just any old kind of shout. I'm talking about a real shout. Amen? Amen. Shout of the Lord. But a lot of times you have to praise by faith. I've heard this, and this is wrong. I've heard this, that they say, you know, I've heard people say, well, when you see me lift my hands, you know the Spirit of the Lord's moving. Well, bless you. You're just so holy and sacred. <laughs> Bless you, Lord. I'll sit around and watch, okay? Until you move your hands, and I know the Spirit of the Lord is moving, man. Isn't that crazy? Isn't 
crazy? Well, if I lift my hands without the Spirit of the Lord moving, I'd blaspheme the Holy. Where in the world do you get this crazy doctrine from? The Bible tells us to lift up our hands. We don't have to have the Spirit of the Lord moving. If you want to get the Spirit of the Lord moving, that's when you do you lift up your hands. Some people say, hey, he's out of order. He just prayed the Lord. You know he ain't feeling nothing. You don't got to feel nothing to praise the Lord. There's scripture after scripture that teaches them. There's whole chapters in the book of Psalms that is written of how we praise the Lord. Some people disagree with that. Some people believe you shouldn't make no racket in church. Some people like that quiet atmosphere. They like the, the, the laid-back atmosphere. But I'm telling you, when you go into a laid-back atmosphere, the next thing you know, you're going to be nodding. And, and, and that's what majority of people do a lot of times in church. I wonder why they even waste their gas to come to church and go to sleep. I'd rather stay at home on my sofa if I wanted to sleep. Amen? I thought y'all said y'all come to have church this evening. Y'all ain't talking to me. Y'all show a lady back. Oh, we're just listening. Bring it all in. Amen. I hope so. Praise God. It even talks about the family. Not only the, not only the leaders, but the leader's family. That's when you know that the Lord's working for you when you begin to have an impact on others. Because it's hard enough to keep us straight. Much less people who live in our house, right? right? And God is saying, before you can reach that world, you got to be able to reach those that are around you. Amen. And I tell you something: sometimes it's easier to reach that world than it is the people that are closest to you. Amen. Because it seems like the people that are closest to you, the hardest ones to get along with. Yeah. Great, bro. I wish I had somebody help me preach tonight. Great. I'm just going to go ahead for you sanctified ones that won't talk to me and give you scripture for that. Wow. Because the foes be they of your own household. While you sit back there sanctified, you don't, you, no, you don't have that problem. Yes, you do. The Bible said the foes, that means enemies, be they of your own household. You get along with the people at heart, but can't get along with the people in your own household. You know what's bad? That's bad for the people who live by themselves. <laughs> When you can't get along with yourself, that's bad. Amen? I've heard Mama Faye tell me many times her and her be having an argument. <laughs> her and her be having an argument. I tell you what, two by fours and two by sixes and shingles and plywood only makes a house. God makes a home. Yeah, yeah. You can have all the TVs. All the music in the house that you want, all the window shades that you bought off the line, it's so pretty. But if the Spirit of God doesn't live in that house, it ain't worth going home to. Amen. 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 I ain't against prospering and, and, and things of this nature as long as God goes with me. Amen. We're talking about building a church. We already got a new fellowship hall uh, probably halfway done. And I tell you what, and I'm thankful for what God's blessed us with, aren't y'all? I'm thankful. But I, I, I stand on this to today, and I've just made it up in my mind that if God don't go with us in this in this business meeting, I mean, not this, but in this uh, fundraise, if God's not with us, I don't want to go. How about y'all? I'd rather just stay right here and let the Lord's presence be here than move up without Him. But I believe with all my heart that the Lord's into it. <laughs> I remember the first time that, that we started raising money for this. And, and uh, I was right there at those altars and I was praying. And we had just, we had just started uh, raising money or, or said we was going to raise some money for this new building project. And in the middle of prayer, I got interrupted. And I'm talking about in the middle of prayer. Most people don't do that. Most people just reverence, say, you know, I just wait. But um, they were on their way to church. And somebody came and got me and said, so and so's here, and, and I don't forgot it was something to do with Mr. Don was flowing on them that came from another church and I don't even remember their name, but anyhow, I came by and had some somehow another day and inherited some money from selling a church they used to go to with members of it or something. And I forgot how many thousands of dollars it was to start with. It was a pretty good chunk of change, 
that I'm talking about the very first week that we had, I think it was, that we started this and interrupted. And I was praying about it at the time. The Lord began to confirm me just then. I'm going to make a way. There's nothing else like the Lord's voice when he comes by and say, I'm going to make a way. Amen. Amen. If we will learn how to behave ourselves in the house of God and behave ourselves in the house of God, God will bless the house of God. Amen? But He's not going to bless it when it's a den of thieves. He's going to throw people out. That's what He's going to do. That's what Jesus came in. All people talk about the grace of God and how kind and precious and humble Jesus was, but Jesus also had a riled up side about Him that if you got Him riled up, He dealt with you. Amen? Amen. He walked into the temple and the Bible said, a lot of people may not have never read this, but the Bible said he drove them out by scourge of whips and cords. He didn't play with them when he come in and they were all selling things in the front of the temple and trying to make gain of the house of God. The house of God is not a place to get gain. The house of God is the house of prayer, but they turn into a den of thieves. But Jesus had an answer for those types of people. He said, hit the road, Jack. You say we don't tell people to hit the road. We're to get people in. We are to get people in, but when they come in with confusion, God's not the author of confusion. They can go back where they came from, amen, if they're not going to behave their self, if they're going to cause confusion, they're not the state. Right. And so God began to uh, work in that building fund and the next thing you know, a couple years later, we got it. We may have to go back and raise some more for us all said and done with, but we got it. And I tell you, it's a blessing, amen, to know that God will provide for his people Especially those that try their best to behave yourself in the house of God. Just another little testimony uh, that that's really a blessing to me. And this is just off the subject from what I'm preaching on. But when I first came to this little church, Mama Faith, she met me out there. And she said, she said, son, I'm going to tell you something. We need, we need something other out there in that front yard besides all this red mud. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't even got voted in yet as a pastor, but she wanted to go ahead and put that order in before I got voted in. <laughs> and I said, what's the problem? I had just got here. I had no clue, and I hadn't been here in a good rain. But she said when it rained, they would roll the uh, bodies and stuff through the red mud and track red mud in the church and this, that, and other, and how she... I didn't know her at the time. didn't know she had all the problems that she had with her legs and her ankles and walking through all the mud and stuff like that. And so I called the I called the board up, buddy. I was moving fast on this order that she that she put in, and I said, oh, I said, let's talk, let's talk about what we can do about fixing the front yard out here. And some began to say, you know, no, we don't we, we don't need no asphalt or nothing like that. I, I I suggested asphalt, and they was like, no, we don't need no asphalt. Let's just get some rocks. I said, no, not right here in the front of the church with all these glass windows. Somebody's going hit one with a lawnmower or something. And then some said saw it, and some said this. And the reason they were saying this was because asphalt was too high. And I just brought a spirit of faith by, and I told them, I said, we got to learn to walk, well, crawl before we walk. I said, let's put our faith, let's put God to the test, and if it's his will to, to have asphalt, he'll make a way. And so we began to start raising money. They agreed that we were going to do some asphalt. And, and about, I don't know, it was, it was a couple months. We had a few thousand dollars or so raised up. And then all of a sudden, uh, we were at, uh, at one of my cousin's birthday parties. And my cousin worked with me at the time. And he, uh, when, when we left that birthday party, he knew that we were coming down there to have a potluck, a little dinner thing. We was... Uh, just for donations, you know, people donating, feeding them at the same time. And I had to leave his, his child's birthday party to come down here. And I told him the reason that I was leaving early and things. And we got back that next Monday and we were driving down the road and my dad had given us a link at that time. Uh, one of these walkie-talkie things that's got a speaker phone on it. And we were coming, and we had drove all the way from Fountain to Alabama Southern. I remember that. I don't know where we were going. But we were coming in front of Alabama Southern, and nobody had said nothing or talked on that link or nothing. And out of the blue, he just came up and asked me. He would talk about church every now and then. He came up and asked me. He was not a church goer, but he came up and asked me. He said, so how'd y'all do at y'all's little potluck yesterday? 
And I don't think we had but two or three thousand dollars saved up at the time, and we were under a twenty-four thousand dollar debt. And uh, so I told him, I said, I think we raised about eight hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, something like that. And I said, I said that's pretty good. I said we got a long ways to go, but I feel like the Lord will make a way. I got it out of my mouth. I ain't kidding y'all. The the link phone went off. That was up in the sun visor of the van at that time. The link phone went off, and it was Sister Willoughby's Adams that goes and went to church for a time. And uh, she says, Brother Brandon, I got something I need to tell you. She didn't say hi about it. You know, a lot of times when they're ready, they say hi about it, somebody. And and uh, she normally didn't call me. She, she normally called my wife if she wanted to talk. She called me that day. She said, I got something I want to tell you. I said, well, go ahead. She said, I was, I was making up my bed this morning. The Lord spoke to me and said, I need to call you and tell you something. She said, I picked up your house phone. I was going to call your wife. And the Spirit of God told me, don't call the wife, call him. He needs to hear it. And so here it is. This is what the Lord told me. That don't worry about your fundraiser. He's going to make a way for it. My cousin looked over at me like, where in the world did that come from? We were just talking about it. i tell you where it came from. It came from somebody that was listening to the Lord and obeyed the Lord. It was a witness to him because just in a couple months, we had $24,000 and we had to ask for pay. Let me tell you something. If God tells you he's supposed to take you places, get in the pastor's seat, hold on. He's going to take you there and just make sure you be thankful for what God's given you and giving him all the praise for it. Amen. To behave ourselves in the house of God is very important. Praise God. Not to be double tongued. Make sure we talk the right things. It tells us leadership. The whole chapter is about leadership, about the deacons, about the pastor, about the pastor's wives, about the deacons' wives. Because deacons' wives and pastors' wives help make them who they are. I believe that. You got a bad marriage, you got a sour house, you're going to have a sour attitude when you come to this house. And that flows on down. You can you can believe that or you can, you cannot believe that. That's up to you. But the way the leadership acts, it's going to rub off on the rest of the church. Amen. I believe it with all my heart that if I've ever heard any wisdom of how to grow, how to grow a church, the best wisdom I ever heard was Things rise and fall upon leadership. Amen? Yeah. That's why a lot of times I like to get up with my deacons and just talk. Just to talk. Yeah. Just to have times of fellowship and talking. That's the reason that I love this little Sunday evening group. Because a lot of times, ain't nobody going nowhere. Most people just hanging out around the church. Some say, I wouldn't do all that. That's fellowship. That is scripture to have fellowship with the brother. That's what the Bible said. That if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we'll have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. 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 When people of the house of God don't like people of the house of God, I wonder if they have any love for God. Amen. The Bible said in 1 John 4 and 20, if a man say he loved God and hated his brother, he's a liar. For if a man loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Amen. That's a good way to measure and judge ourselves tonight. Do you like that one sitting beside you? Yeah. Do you love him? Yeah. I've seen people, let me tell you what I have seen. I've seen people that walk up into the house of God and if there be somebody there else of an other color, they'll get them walk out. You better get that mess right before you get with God. Oh, bless the Lord, blah, blah. You ain't got one scripture to stand on. <laughs> Amen? I think it was Moses that had an Ethiopian wife and Aaron and Miriam got to run in their mouth about it. God cursed him. Then he made Moses turn around and pray for him. <laughs> hey, I know in the South we're raised to be prejudices and this, that. You better get that spirit out of your heart before you stand before God. Amen. You can't go to heaven by not liking people of a different color. Galatians 3 and 28 says there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. And that's why Paul withstood Peter. We cannot have that respect of persons. 
The Bible said if we say to one person with gay clothing on or, or fancy clothing on, or say come up here and sit to the front and then we look down on the poor person tell him to sit you in the back, that's respect of persons and God won't have to be respect of persons. Amen? We need to treat everyone equally. Can I get an amen right there? In my closing tonight, God says he wants us to behave ourselves in the house of God. If anything's, if anything's been said tonight that hurts you, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you, but I don't apologize for preaching the word of God. Because when you really begin to search this book out, there's a lot of stuff in this book that some folks ain't living. Some church folks ain't living. And if I don't say what the word says, then I'm going to give a count of judgment for withholding back. Some people feel like that if you do something, it's a sin. But sometimes it's a sin not to do something. James said, him to know it to do good and do it that not to him, it is sin. And so there's many times as people come into the house of the Lord and we don't preach. You know, we sit over here and, 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 and pick this one out and say, well, I can't say that one because this one's living like this. It's a time to quit preaching. I'm all your friends. I love every one of you. When I climb in this pulpit, I got a job to do. Amen? Amen. That job's hard to do sometimes. But he who the Son is made free will be free indeed. How many wants Amen. to be free tonight? Amen. Stay free. Stay behaving. If you know it's right to praise God, don't you let a spirit coming here. That, that's what I don't understand when people tell me I would praise the Lord if this one would praise the Lord. I start praising more if the church praises more. You don't base what you do off of anyone. If you want to base what you do off of something based upon this and he's told us to praise the Lord. You cannot praise the Lord too much. You make him praise the Lord too loud if the preaching's going on. We're not to be done out of order and to interrupt things of that nature. But when it comes to worship time and music time and choir time, we're to lift up hands. We're to get in one mind and one accord. The reason I'm preaching this is because I know it'll work. I know this seems like old lima beans. And I feel like I feed this to you all the time. But I know it'll work. The very first revival I ever went to and I was seeking for the Holy Ghost. Brother Mike and Brother Robert Wilson held for us down there, and I walked in that service, and, and these people did not have a whole lot of knowledge when it comes to uh, 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 credentials and ordination and all this, that, and other. They didn't have all that. But I watched them old country folks get up in that church, and they had church. One, one instant, I remember we started church, they began to clap. Just praise the Lord by clap. And they clout and clout and clout. I thought I was going to beat my hands off. And the next thing you know, the Spirit of the Lord began to fall in that saints where ain't nobody preached, ain't nobody sung. They just began to worship and praise God, and the power of God will begin to move in the churches. Yeah. After that service, and I finally felt the power of God, knew it was real, came back to our own home church, and I'm going to testify this before, walked back in that church and stayed in the door there. Church is what you make out of it. You didn't get nothing out. You just told on yourself because you didn't put nothing in. You reap what you sow. God's got plenty of glory that he would like to pour out on his people. If we suffer with him, we'll reign with him. But he's not going to pour something other out that we're not using. He said he gave one man one talent, one man three talent, one man five talents, I think was the number of them. He said the one with the five talent used the five talents, got five talents more. One that had the three used the three, got three more. But the one who had the one went and hid his talent in the earth. And it was so disturbing to God that he told the servant to depart from him. Slothful, wicked servant, worker of iniquity. And took the one talent that he went and hid and gave it to somebody who would use it. We want more of God. We, we need to begin to use what God has given us. Amen. 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 Father, I come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, Lord. I thank you for this word to behave ourselves. Our flesh can do things what we want to do sometimes besides what we know to do. And if our flesh tells us, let's just don't worship tonight. You know, it's a Sunday evening. We're tired. 
ready to go home. I hope he ain't home when this Sunday evening, Lord knows. I've just been tired all week. I need to go home and get me some rest. Father, sometimes we don't even know what real rest is all about. The Bible said there's a rest to the people of God. Stammering lips. Unknown tone when you speak to your people. And we enter into that rest signifying the Holy Ghost would come. Coming to you all of we labor and heavy laden, you'll give us rest. We have plenty of rest in our bodies, but don't have no rest in our spirit. We're still tired after we wake up from eight hours of sleep. We go around yawning all day long. But when our flesh don't feel like praising God, help us to wrestle with our flesh and bring our flesh under subjection. I think it was 1 Corinthians 9 and 26. Paul, there, Paul said, I therefore so run, not as uncertain, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it under subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to the other time, myself should be a castaway. The great psalmist said, Oh, my soul, why is thou disquieted with him? It's disquieted with me because our flesh is enmity against you, Lord. There's a war going on. Paul said, That what I do, that I would do, I do not. That I would do, that I do. And whenever time I go to find to do good, I find that evil is present with me. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ. There will my mind. I serve the law of the Spirit. With the flesh, the law of sin and death. But he says there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ. Which walk not after the flesh, but walk in the spirit. Father, help us to walk in the spirit. Help us to put on Christ. Help us to behave ourselves the way we're supposed to be. Let's all stand tonight. DJ needs to.